The red deer is one of the largest and most iconic deer species. Found in most parts of Europe, the animal is highly adaptable to a wide variety of environments. With a range spanning from Ireland to Iraq, the red deer has a strong connection to European history, featuring in the artwork and stories of many cultures. While they're most recognisable for the massive antlers featured on the males, also known as stags, I'd argue that the behaviour of the females, or hinds, is just as interesting. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's start with the species classification. The red deer was first scientifically ranked in 1758 by Carl Linnaeus, who is already making his third appearance on this channel despite it only being my sixth video. The species would later be placed in the infraorder Pecora, alongside pronghorns, giraffes, okapi, antelope, and many others. As an infraorder, this grouping falls under both orders and suborders of species. In this case, its order, Artiodactyla, consists of even-toed ungulates, or animals with hooves that bear their weight on an even number of their five toes. Its suborder, Ruminantia, describes species with ruminant digestion, a feature of the four-chambered stomachs most commonly associated with sheep and cattle. Therefore, members of the infraorder Pecora are recognised as even-toed ungulates with ruminant digestion. Along with the species I mentioned before, in this infraorder we can find Cervidae, a family that contains all living and extinct deer species. Now this is where things can get a little bit confusing because deer taxonomy has been in a state of flux for many years, with species commonly moved between rankings. This is especially the case for Cervus, the red deer's genus. While now only consisting of a handful of members, this genus once contained a wide range of species that are now recognised under different genera. Until the 1970s, Cervus also include members of the genus Axis, which contains the Chital, Dharma, the genus of fallow deer, and the Chinese species Milu, also known as Pear David's deer. Until the late 1980s, the genera that now contain Barasinga, Eld's deer, Javan Rusa, and Sambar deer were also all part of this one genus. But today, the few species that remain in service include the Sika, Central Asian or Tarim red deer, and Thorold's deer, although genetic evidence suggests that it belongs in a different genus too. Up until the turn of the century, Elk or Wapiti were considered the same species as red deer, largely based on the fully fertile hybrid species that could be bred in captive conditions. Mitochondrial DNA studies conducted in 2004 revealed that not only should this species be separately recognised, but that elk are actually more closely related to Thorold's deer, or even the seeker, than they are to red deer. As its own species though, the red deer has a storied history. The species' earliest fossils date back to an era known as the Middle Pleistocene, around 800,000 years ago. These early forms belong to the subspecies Cervus elephus acoronatus, which was similar in size to the larger subspecies of red deer we see today. And speaking of subspecies, the red deer is actually the first animal I'm covering that has them, with 13 variants recognised in total. A subspecies is the lowest level of taxonomic ranking, and is used when two different populations of animal are distinguished from one another but not quite different enough to constitute a new species. A common criterion of this ranking is that the different populations should be able to interbreed, but as we saw with the elk before, that isn't always a perfect metric to go off of. Subspecies tend to be some of the most volatile animals in terms of taxonomic ranking, and the red deer is no exception. Recent genetic studies suggest that the Barbary stag, the red deer's only subspecies native to Africa, is virtually indistinguishable from the Sardinian and Corsican populations, generally referred to as the Corsican red deer. Further analysis suggests that these two subspecies should be grouped together under one separate species. For the other subspecies, we can distinguish between them through a number of factors, but let's get into that in the next section. Based on body mass, the red deer is likely the fourth largest living deer species on average, behind the moose, elk, and sambar deer. But with such a broad range and habitat, differences between subspecies can be stark. The Carpathian stag is the largest of the group, weighing up to 500 kilograms or 1,100 pounds. At the other end of the scale, the Corsican red deer weighs about 80 to 100 kilograms or 180 to 220 pounds. 
In poor habitats, some of the smaller subspecies can weigh as little as 53 kilograms, or just 120 pounds. All red deer grow thicker coats of hair during autumn, which helps insulate them during the winter. The males of some subspecies also receive neck manes during this time, with those from the British Isles and Norway typically being the thickest and most noticeable. Red deer in warmer regions such as the Caspian red deer or morale and the Spanish red deer do not carry these manes, while females never have them irrespective of the subspecies. Along with their body size, the coats of red deer are useful in distinguishing between subspecies. The Central European or common red deer and the Caspian red deer are both larger subspecies, but while the Central European has a light coloured coat with black bordering, the Caspian is grey in the winter and dark brown in the summer. We can see a similar thing in smaller subspecies like Norwegian, Scottish and Spanish red deer, with the Scottish having the lightest coat, the Spanish the darkest, and the Norwegian somewhere between the two. By the beginning of summer, the red deer's heavy winter coat has already been shed. The species are known to rub against trees and other objects to help remove the excess hair from their bodies. Red deer have different coloration based on the seasons and types of habitats, with grey or lighter coloration prevalent in the winter, and a more reddish and darker coat in the summer. A few spots being present on the backs of summer coats is not uncommon, and this is a trait some individuals retain from adolescence. Red deer can live for over 20 years in captivity, while it's rare for one to survive past their 13th birthday in the wild. The subspecies that face less predation pressure can average slightly higher at 15 years. Finally, let's get into this species' most defining trait, its antlers. Like neck manes, only the stags have antlers, although they too can vary in size depending on the individual and subspecies. Antlers typically measure 71 centimetres or 28 inches in length and weigh 1 kilogram or 2.2 pounds. In rare cases, it can grow to be 115 centimetres or 45 inches long, weighing up to 5 kilograms or 11 pounds. Unlike the horns found on bovids, antlers do not contain keratin and are simply an extension of the animal's skull. Deer are also unique in that they shed their antlers and regrow them on a seasonal basis. The red deer's antlers grow at a rapid rate, sometimes managing 2.5 centimetres or 1 inch in a single day. While the antlers are growing, they're covered in a highly vascular skin called velvet, which supplies oxygen and nutrients to the growing bone. The antlers are testosterone driven, and as the stag's levels drop in autumn, the velvet is shed and the antlers stop growing. For stags, having the biggest and best antlers is not only important in finding a mate, but in their very survival. Antlers grow faster than any other mammal bone, and this results in an immense nutritional demand on deer to regrow antlers annually. If they can't size up against male competitors, they may be unable to partake in the mating season. Even worse, a red deer with smaller or weaker antlers makes for attractive prey. On the topic of this species' behaviours, let's explore further in the next section. Male red deer retain their antlers for over half the year, but become more isolated from other stags during this time. Combined with its strong front leg kicking action that can be performed by both sexes, these antlers provide the stags with ample self-defense against predators. Once the antlers are shed, however, stags tend to reform bachelor groups, which allow them to cooperatively work together. Without the security of their antlers, it appears that joining a herd is a necessity. During the mating season, known as the rut for ruminants, Mature stags will compete for the attentions of the hinds. Rival stags challenge opponents with a vocalisation known as belling, while walking in parallel. This allows combatants to assess each other's antlers and body size. If neither stag backs down, a clash of antlers can occur, sometimes leading to serious injury. For stags under 4 or over 11 years old, finding a mate can be difficult. Dominant stags with the largest bodies and antlers follow groups of hinds during the rut, and will defend them from other males. Some may keep as many as 20 hinds in a harem, although few are able to achieve this as the task is extremely demanding on the stag's body. Harem holding stags rarely feed during this time and may lose up to 20% of their body weight, meaning that only the largest and fittest males are able to maintain control. Being prepared for the mating season is incredibly important, as stags that enter the rut in poor condition are less likely to make it through to the peak conception period. 
Mature stags at around eight years old tend to be the most successful for this reason. Red deer stags have a distinctive roar that they use almost exclusively during the rut. The vocalization is an adaptation to the forested environments the species typically lives in. In contrast to elk stags, which make a different sound due to the open plains they occupy. A male red deer that has a large body and antlers, produces a loud roar and can beat other males in antler fights is the most likely to be successful during the rut. But for many males, fighting over females isn't something they have to be too concerned about, as red deer stags are one of hundreds of mammals that are known to exhibit same-sex couplings, with some showing no interest in the hinds at all. After mating, gestation lasts between 240 and 262 days, with the offspring weighing in at about 15 kilograms or 35 pounds at birth. After two weeks, calves are able to join the herd and are fully weaned for their mothers at two months of age. After the rut, Females form large herds of as many as 50 mothers and calves. The newborn calves are kept close to the hinds with a series of vocalizations between the two, which means that these herds experience constant chatter during the daylight hours. With no males around at this time of year, the largest and most robust females will take a stand when the group is approached by predators, using their front legs to kick at their attackers if needs be. In most cases, Guttural grunts and posturing is effective in dissuading all but the most determined of predators. Aside from human hunters and their dogs, the grey wolf is likely the most dangerous predator that red deer encounter. Occasionally, they may also be hunted by brown bears. The calves remain with their mothers for almost a full year, leaving around the time the next season's offspring are birthed. Like in many species, male red deer have little involvement in the raising of the young, and will be regrowing their antlers for the next rut at this stage. While they may differ in many other ways, this gestation and development period is consistent across all subspecies. Red deer have been a part of human culture for just about as long as they've been around. The species have been walking the earth for at least 500,000 years before the earliest humans, while the ancestors of the Cervus genus first appear in fossil records 12 million years ago. The red deer is among some of the most common species seen in cave art throughout Europe, with some depictions dating back to 40,000 years ago. This makes the red deer one of the first animals to be portrayed in art, at least in terms of what we have records of. After all, it's unknown how much cave art has been lost in the millennia since. More recently, the red deer is seen in Pictish stones from the early medieval period in Scotland. In England, the now archaic word heart is synonymous with stag and was featured in several of Shakespeare's plays, most notably in The Twelfth Night. The surnames Hart and Hartley derive from this word. In more modern times, the red deer is perhaps best known for its depiction in The Monarch of the Glen by Sir Edwin Landseer. Completed in 1851, the oil painting was commissioned as part of a series to hang in the Palace of Westminster in London. It quickly became one of the most popular paintings of the 19th century, sold widely in reproductions in steel engraving. Eventually, it was bought by companies to use in advertising, leading to it becoming something of a cliché by the mid-20th century. Outside of the art world, the red deer is widely used in consumer products. Domesticated populations are kept on deer farms and harvested for their meat, known as venison. While historically restricted to those with connections to the aristocratic or poaching communities, venison is now a more available meat in European supermarkets. Its connection to the upper class is not completely lost, however, as the meat tends to be significantly more expensive than beef or chicken, while being higher in protein and lower in fat. Red deer stags can produce 10 to 15 kilograms or 20 to 35 pounds of antler velvet annually. This velvet has a strong market in East Asia, where it's used in holistic medicines, with South Korea being the primary consumer. In Russia, a medication produced from the velvet is sold under the brand name Pantocrin. Finally, the antlers of the red deer have long been used as decorations, either just on their own or to produce horn furniture. While once a popular trend in the late 19th and early 20th century, interest in horn furniture dropped off sharply at the end of the 1920s. Today, the lodge style and cabin decor trend in modern households is seeing reinvigorated interest in this design, but I certainly am not, this stuff is ugly as hell. The red deer is a naturally occurring species in over 40 countries across Europe and North Africa. It can be found in a triangular range spanning Morocco to Azerbaijan to Norway. 
the species is known to migrate, spending its winters at lower altitudes in more wooded terrain to help fend off the cold. During the summer, it moves to higher elevations where food supplies are greater and the weather is better for the mating season. Taking a look at the IUCN red list, we can see that the species is ranked as least concern, which is unsurprising given its huge range and population. Current data suggests that despite the impacts of deforestation and hunting from humans, red deer have only been increasing in global numbers. In all of Europe, excluding Russia, the species numbered 1.25 million individuals in 1985, climbing to 2.4 million by 2005. However, the same cannot be said for all red deer populations, as this species faces different challenges depending on the region. Notably, the North African populations have been consistently declining in the last 40 years, while red deer in Central Europe are impacted by population fragmentation. With the sheer number of subspecies and intermingling that occurs between them, accurately tracking how deer populations are faring can be especially difficult. While as a whole the animal is thriving, its diminishing populations in some areas could be serious reason for concern. Most populations have enjoyed rapid growth in the last century, thanks in part to human impact on the species predators. The Caspian tiger, the Barbary lion and the Atlas bear were all hunted to extinction by humans, with last known sightings for each occurring over 60 years ago. This has allowed the red deer population to flourish, although the long-term impact this will have on their ecosystems is unlikely to be positive. Arguably, however, the greater concern regarding the red deer is how it impacts ecosystems in the regions it's been introduced to. In Argentina and Chile, the red deer's presence acts as competition to native species like the South Andean deer or humal, which is already recognised as endangered. Like many other animals, the red deer was brought to Australia and New Zealand in the mid-19th century for the purpose of game hunting. As an already unethical practice, the impacts of this are made even more frustrating due to the fact that this species has thrived in these countries in the years since. Alongside foxes, rabbits and many other species, the presence of red deer in these environments has caused great harm to the natural ecosystem. The species is regarded as a pest in all four of these countries, and is heavily culled to reduce its impact where possible. Even in countries where they are naturally occurring, state-sanctioned hunting is often a requirement to keep their populations in check. When it comes to animals like this, human nature finds it easier to view them as the direct cause of the problem. Rather than blaming it all on the species though, maybe we should look at why their populations are ballooning in this way. Often, it's because something else in the ecosystem is already failing. Thank you for watching. This was the first animal I've covered where I didn't have the benefit of prior knowledge going in, so I'm sure there's plenty more interesting information out there that you can find on your own. Next time though, we're talking about a species that isn't quite as widespread, at least not anymore. I'll be taking a look at quite possibly the cutest marine animal, the sea otter. As always, if you're interested in hearing about this species or any future stuff on this channel, you can subscribe and I'll see you then.